Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. All right, so this is going to be an interesting episode. This one is recorded in a local cafe and restaurant called Stelly's down in LeBeau, Louisiana. I'm going to be talking to Bill Cheek and his wife Janice. Please don't let multiple Janices on one podcast confuse you too much. We're going to be talking about crawfish. We've got two different species. We talk about what the ponds look like. We talk about how it's cooked and some of the cultural history that it comes to. I really did enjoy it. I also want to go ahead and make a little disclaimer. When I am down south for a long time, my accent gets thicker and you will tell I was in Louisiana a few days before this. So hope you enjoy it. Today, Grounded by the Farm is on location. This is the first time we've done something like this where we're in a store. We're at, is it called Stelly's in LeBeau? That's correct. And Bill, I need to start with the most controversial question. Okay. Is it crawfish, crawdads, crayfish, mud bugs, or what? What all, do you call all them? All of the above. <laughs> Depends on what part of the country you're from. <laughs> <laughs> Down here, do we call them crawfish? We call them crawfish. Yeah. Or mud bugs. Or mud bugs. You know. That's but we do, we do have respect for them. Yeah. 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 Well, I think um, so many people, so I now live in the Midwest and um, used to live down in Greenville, Mississippi area. Mm-hmm. So I have had a lot of crawfish boils in my life. But a lot of people have never eaten crawfish. So they think of crawfish as that thing they find in the creek. So can you tell me the difference in what we're talking about as a farmed product versus that thing you find mysteriously in a creek? Well, crawfish are found all over the country, but there's a lot of different species. But there's mainly two species here in Louisiana that we raise and that's the white crawfish or white river crawfish and then the red swamp crawfish and the red swamp crawfish is more desirable for whatever reasons I think there's a stigma with the white crawfish but you get past a certain area in Louisiana up north they don't care white red doesn't matter does it actually is a crawfish actually white no actually they're two different well, just to tell you the difference and, and the reason that people prefer the red over the white is when you really get into eating crawfish, sucking the heads, so <laughs> to speak, Yeah. the uh, red crawfish has a yellow fat, what oh, we call the fat. I do know about the this tasty. then. The white crawfish, it's greenish and it okay. is a different flavor. So, yeah. But when it comes to the tail, you can't tell the difference. Yeah. Actually... <laughs> There was a guy that I talked to in Memphis one time Uh who said that that's what his customers really liked was the white fish. Yeah. Are there programs in like the extension service and stuff to come up with new crawfish that might be hardier so I could have them a little longer in the season or something like that? Are there people doing research on it? Oh, there's a lot of research being done. Uh, LSU Ag Center, of course, has done research for years. Mm -hmm. What used to be uh, University of Southern Louisiana, USL, they used to have a program where they did a lot of work, but they don't have that anymore. But LSU does extensive work uh, with crawfish. And But as far as developing or coming out with a new strain or anything like that, that hasn't been done. I don't know that it ever will be. Well, I would love them to come out with bigger tails all the time, you know, um, where where it just show up early. Little lobsters. Yeah, exactly. Quite frankly, I would love that. Yeah, right. (laughs) I I actually asked a guy at Texas A&M. They have an aquaculture center down in Corpus Christi. And I asked him if he was going to work on that because they were working on shrimp at that location. Mm. And I thought that it would be a nice thing for them to – they hadn't figured it out. Is is Louisiana really the only place crawfish are grown in the U.S.? You know, they grow some in California. Do they? Yeah. Now, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I do know that there's some there. And, of course, in the Beaumont, Texas yeah. area where there's, there's East rice Texas. Country. It's almost Louisiana. East Texas. But they're – not anywhere near Louisiana. I'd say 98% of the crawfish come from Louisiana. And that's just a guess. But yeah. It's part of the culture here, right? Like it is. It's, tell uh, me how that works. Well, from what I understand, actually, way back when, the Indians 
taught the Acadians really? to eat crawfish. Yeah. So it came from the no, Native Americans. It, it did. Helping folks that Supposedly, were. Supposedly, at least yeah. that's the story, the way the story goes. You know, I don't know who first looked at them and thought, ooh, if I just warm that up and put some spice with it, that'd be tasty. Cause that I guess they were just hungry. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you get hungry yeah. enough, you'll eat anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think some people look at crawfish like that now. If they haven't been to Louisiana much, if they haven't spent a lot of time in the Deep South, they may not have had them, and, and they don't know what they're missing. They, and they don't. I'm telling you, when you get them up in a place <coughs> like St. Louis, you start turning people's heads around a little bit. You know, we were in St. Louis uh, oh, several years ago, and I happened to, at a few restaurants, I asked them about crawfish, and they, you know, they wanted to know more about it, and some of them actually handled them. But yeah. now our markets are really expanding. Can you uh, tell me how that's working out? Like, is it, because I like boiled crawfish mm -hmm. a lot. When you say the market's expanding, mm -hmm. where does the market expand? Because I don't think it's going to be like throwing bulls and doing them live, right? Right. And and I'm glad that you asked that. The newest thing going now is what's called whole boil. Hmm. And what it is, the, the plants, most of the your processing plants that already do the peeled tail meat, they're also doing whole boil now. It's really creating... Uh, I guess a better venue for your smaller crawfish. Right. And what they're doing, they're actually boiling these crawfish just like we would, only with less seasoning mm -hmm. because people you never are different, know. you know. Yeah. And they're packaging these <coughs> in five pound uh, bags and they are shipping them all over the U.S. and even outside. Oh, goodness. And people are learning how to eat crawfish. So, it's it's really it's really been good for the industry. Well, I think about it how much travel people do now and discovering new areas, and they like to bring some of those foods home. I can remember mm -hmm. Cafe Du Monde has had, you know, their chicory coffee and mm -hmm. beignet mix for decades. So it seems reasonable that folks would also want to try in some crawfish and, yeah. and kind of introduce that to folks locally, maybe in an etouffee or some gumbo or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll have to see if they get the roux right, because that's a big problem if you make the wrong roux. That's right. <laughs> but, you know, talking about the, uh, the whole ball, one of the docks and plants that I deal with had a call from, I believe it was Minnesota, I think. Really? Looking for whole ball crawfish. Let's talk about how you grow crawfish, because okay. we're talking about it like it's a crop that's grown. And mm -hmm. how do you do that? You rotate it with something else? It is rotated out with rice mm -hmm. somewhat, but you don't have to have a rice field or rice, okay. you know, to, in order to have crawfish. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but if you want to know from the beginning. Yeah. When do you start crawfish? Okay. I guess, so you, you're going to harvest your rice or. Well, let, let's just say that you're starting out new. Okay. Without. You've never done crawfish before, but right. you're going to do crawfish. Let's say that you're going to build a crawfish pond. Yep. Well, you're going to have a pond that's going to hold, be able to hold about, you know, two to three feet of water. Okay. okay. Your levees will be that size. And even though crawfish are naturally everywhere, mm -hmm. I mean, here, they're either the reds they or just the whites. They just come up. They come up. They're there. Mm -hmm. But you still have to seed that pond okay. or stock it. So you would complete your pond. You would probably, in late summer, plant a crop for those crawfish. Okay. okay. Sudan is a... Sudan grass? Yeah, Sudan grass is probably second best to rice straw. Okay. Straw. Actually, we use that when we're not planting a rice crop. You would already have put water in it and stocked about anywhere from 60 to 80 pounds of crawfish, live crawfish, just go buy them from mm -hmm. wherever, stock those in that pond per acre. Right. Okay. Uh, you would, after they were in there and got acclimated, you would slowly drain that water. Yeah. Once the pond was dry, say in August, you would plant a Sudan crop or something for mm -hmm. them. Then again in October, you would flood your pond again. Okay. During that time that you put them back in the ground, of course, that's where they're going to have their babies. Yeah in the burrows. They'll huh. no normally burrow an average of two feet, okay. say, two feet deep. They 
when they burrow down there they create a much want to call it a borough create a cavity down there and that's where they live they try mm-hmm. to stay where there's water where it's moist when you flood that pond at some point they'll come back out of the ground with their eggs or with the babies under the tails mm-hmm. of course then they'll those babies will leave the mama crawfish they'll disperse throughout that pond and i mean they'll disperse throughout mm-hmm. that, that pond and they start growing yeah now normal harvest starts in january february but there's some harvest being done in november and december also way down south yeah yeah uh and of course that's kind of i'm not going to say the life cycle but that's the way you get started in it yeah and what determines how late you'll be able to harvest because you know sometimes i can have crawfish it feels like i'm going to be almost july 4th sometimes it feels like that's right right and that all depends on nature okay That's one of the things about crawfish farming. We raised catfish for Mm -hmm. over 20 years. Well, that's a whole crop in itself, you know, and a lot to learn there. But it's still water farming. Yeah. Water farming is just different from row crop farming. Nature plays such a big part in it. Not that nature doesn't play a big part in everything, but especially in management of crawfish. You're, you're limited with your management. Right. Uh, your weather patterns, all kind of things just take precedence. Yeah. You can tell it's getting fun here it's in Stelly's. And you know what I'm thinking is like catfish probably goes over pretty good in a place like this. It, it does. <laughs> but I bet you a catfish sandwich now yeah. and then really hits the spot. <laughs> Um, especially on Fridays once you get yeah, into the, that's right. the season there of that's Easter right. and all. If somebody's never been to a crawfish bowl, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. how would you explain that to them? Because I'm telling you, it's a unique cultural experience if you're not from that part of the South. Well, first of all, they'd probably be looking for the experience if they were there, <laughs> you know, wondering, exactly. okay, what can I learn about this? You know, I would probably just explain to them that really it's just a small lobster in effect yeah texture a little bit different yeah you know taste is better yeah i believe and you just really have to show them how to do it exactly you know it's one of those things where you just don't experience that just anywhere exactly in the u.s or other countries i think it's a lot like um a cookout in a lot of places or a barbecue in a lot of places or some places do a shrimp bowl right it's cultural it's it's a really normal part of celebrating things or just getting people together except it's all done sort of outside i've I've, i i rarely see anybody cook them inside or anything Right. right and we typically put up some big drums and some big flat boards and pour the crawfish out once they've been boiled you just pull them out in the baskets and pour them on the table that's right a a little seasoning depends on how you know how many people you know are from outside this area how soft you go on some seasoning sometimes what all do you put in with the the crawfish because you know this is this is debated in some circles yeah do you put anything in with them or do you put in some potatoes everybody has their own yeah we always put in corn and potatoes you know those are two things that's going to go into any crawfish bowl it's then when you get into mushrooms that's right it's been expanded into mushrooms Mm. just uh, what broccoli yeah you know any kind of cauliflower cauliflower (laughs) but you better put it in a container because it's going to fall apart yeah but if you have a lot of seasoning in that pot, that's what's going to soak up the seasoning. So you better have something to drink with it because <laughs> it's going to be pretty spicy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> It'll get to you pretty fast if you're not careful. A good enough sized potato, yeah. that helps on it the does. spiciness sometimes. It, it, it does. But that but cauliflower soaks it up and the mushrooms. Oh, Lord. And everybody has, and of course, lemons. Yeah. You know, yeah. for flavor. But nowadays there's so many mixes that you can yeah. buy you know and to put in the pot most people do that yeah. some of them put it in the pot some of them sprinkle it on them after they boil them yep just a variety of ways yeah like cooking anything at a crawfish boil somebody told me it takes too long to eat crawfish and i said well that's mm-hmm. part of the reason we enjoy them because you get all that time to stand around and chat with everybody else right now i gotta say you know you probably peel a lot faster than i do because it takes a while to learn it yeah but you know there's there's some shortcuts and so you just teach them the shortcuts yeah and 
hope yeah. that they learn it. You that know. nice little twist helps, and all one motion with your thumb going up. There you go. I I'm, mean, I'll have to put a video of uh, some of the recommendations on the website because it's hard to learn it if you haven't seen it over and over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and you just and, have and to like play with it. There's some shortcuts, it. you know. Yeah. And some people, it has a vein in the tail. Yeah. Some people want to remove that. Remove it. Some, like myself, don't care. <laughs> We're just <laughs> popping in our mouth the way it is, you know. Yeah. More flavor. How do you like crawfish cooked most at home? I know when you and Janice are at home or you've got kids coming over or something, mm -hmm. um, besides a boil, which I think mm -hmm. is a standard process, what are the kind of dishes y'all like to make at home? Mainly etouffee or fried. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what Janice does mostly. Yeah. Uh, it's real good in lasagna. Uh, I say lasagna. Uh, something I like guess. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and meat pies and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> anything that you can put any kind of meat in, you know. You can tell I'm getting hungry, yeah, right? I, I could tell that. <laughs> <laughs> How would you explain this area of Louisiana to folks? Because I'll tell you, a lot of people come to Louisiana and they go to only New Orleans or Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. and they don't get to get out in these areas that I'm lucky enough to be driving through today and stuff. How would you describe it to folks? Really, it's your typical farm country. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got... Like in any other state, you've got what we call the flat country, mm -hmm. and then you've got hill country. Mm -hmm. Well, you're only going to find your crawfish in, in your flat country. Right. Okay. I mean, you have regular yeah. row crop fields like anywhere else, You'll and, have but, but you have a lot of rice fields. Yeah. You'll have that, trees lining that, fields occasionally, like as a windbreak or something, but not too many trees down here because you have some good open spaces. Yeah, of course. We have a lot of woods. I mean, you know, just mm -hmm. hundreds of acres of uh, Great blocks timber. Of, of woods. Yeah. yeah, timber is a timber is the number one industry in Louisiana. Is it really? It is. It is. I had no uh, idea. Producing, yeah, yeah. I don't and think that's what I normally right, think comes about. Comes in it. pretty close. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah. No, you don't. But uh, yeah, timber is a big, yeah. especially up in North Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah, <coughs> I actually was talking to somebody about some trees they had the other day. I oh learned yeah. an awful lot about managing timber. You guys are pretty close to rivers all around. We're running through this area. Louisiana's pretty low to sea level. Right. <laughs> Not a lot of change in grades unless you're looking at a levee for a river or a levee for a field. Uh, there's no shortage of water. Here. Yeah. But that is a concern that, that we have, especially water farming. There's more and more... I think in the future, regulations on our on yeah. our water uh, water sources, our wells, and so forth. Yeah. So that's a concern that we have. But we try to manage our water. NRCS works with us real good. Uh, there's a lot of incentives there for working with with uh, our water and trying to manage right. it properly. And when you're talking about that, you're talking about getting water on the field when you want it, Correct. and getting it off when you'd like it off. Right. That's right. And making sure you maintain that high-quality, clean water when it goes into our rivers and streams. I know farmers are real right. concerned about making sure they keep the environment in great care. We are. And, you know, we catch a lot of flack about it sometimes. But now and then. Hey, we care probably more about it than anyone else because we make our living that way. Yeah, and I hear that maybe your family likes to go fishing out in some of those lakes and rivers yeah, around here. Did you here. hear about that? <laughs> I did. Yeah. I did. They were asking as we walked in. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> we grew up together. Yeah. And y'all are from this area mm -hmm. of Louisiana? Yes. I'd love for you to tell me the history, and maybe we'll pass the mic over to Janice if she wants okay. to talk. Sure. All right, we'll do that. Since it's her family's background to be here, and, and she's like, well, I'm not sure I want to do the talking. <laughs> Billy's a better no. speaker than I am, but I'll, I'll do my best. So tell me about the history of this place. But uh, my grandmother started this place in the 1920s. I'm not exactly sure of the date when she decided to retire. Of course, it was a family business, and yeah. it's not at all like it was back in the early days. They had a blacksmith shop. It was the center of town, probably. It was. This was the town, really. Yeah. Um, bus drivers would come, you know, uh, come through, and if they had trouble, they'd spend the night in the two-story house out back. There was just anything that you needed, you could find it here, the grocery store, yeah. little cafe, gasoline. But when she retired, my dad and uncle and then my, my dad's brother-in-law mm -hmm. took over the place. And they ran it just like she did, but they expanded. 
Yeah. And then years later, when my dad decided to retire, the older ones, they passed it on to my sister and yeah. two brothers. Actually, we had the opportunity to, to buy into it, but we were ready to get out of town, I guess. Do something different. <laughs> right. And so we moved to the Alexandria area. Billy yeah. worked for the railroad, and I was a nurse back in the olden days. Well, you can kind of feel your family's love of, of uh, aquaculture and wildlife in the space. You can tell that hunting and fishing has kind of been in the family for a while. Right. And um, today hunters are coming in from having a long day out in the field. This is a, a favorite place for people to gather. Yeah. Um, this time of the year, especially with the hunters, you know, yeah. uh, it's where they, they come afterwards and get talk about their trophies. <laughs> yes. I-49 has taken away some of the business yeah. here where people were traveling on 71, yeah. like you said, between Alexandria and Baton Rouge. But locals still love it, I can tell. Just, I mean, being at the front door around here, you can tell folks yes. love coming by here and seeing each other. And it, it has an incredible sense of community, it seems like. It does, and um, it's one of those... It this grabs her heart, the, <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> but people come here, you know, and they, they talk about their families. Some people like to gossip. Yeah. But it's because we care, you know. Yeah. Everyone cares well, about Well, I can tell if I needed to get some new pots for a crawfish bowl or something here. I got some etouffee pans behind oh, me. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. A, it's, it's really some of the important things that you guys have available. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> likes to cook. All of my brother-in-laws and brothers cook, and yeah. I'm still trying to get Billy to uh, kind of <laughs> help me out a little bit. He, he's, he can cook, but he, he doesn't do it very often. <laughs> but, uh, of course, food is a big part of the culture here in Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. And have you passed that on to the rest of your family, the next generation? Are they cooks, too? They're singers. Oh, well, they do <laughs> like to sing. They're into, into music. My grandchildren I'm talking about, we have ten grandchildren. You know, they, they'll call me every now and then asking how to cook something. We have our kids and our grandkids over to the house quite often, yeah. and we like to get together. I was going to say, I'm sure you love having them as close by as you can and as often as you can. Um, we do. It's, it's really kind of nice. And I bet you're going to want to pass that microphone back. <laughs> can you tell me, with your farm, how do you sell your crawfish? Do you sell through distributors, or how, how do, what do you do at the end of the year as you're harvesting as you go? What happens to the crawfish when they come off your farm? Of course, our farm is spread out. We have one farm near our house, and then we have another farm about 40 miles away, okay. which is here in Lebeau. That's where most of our production is. Here in, in Lebeau, I have a brother-in-law that owns a dock. We call him a dock here. It's just a place where we go and sell our crawfish. I would say at least 95% of our production goes to a dock. Okay. Then, of course, that dock sells to your restaurants, you know. Your yeah. In Louisiana, there's some places that are only open during the crawfish season, and that's all they do is sell crawfish. Exactly. You know, and it's a live market. Now, one of the other places that I sell near my house, they have a peeling plant and also do the whole ball. Okay. And the live market. Yeah. So everything there is sold there. We do sell, uh, I'm going to say, maybe 5% to the public. Yeah. If we know people that want them. Yeah. But we really try not to do much of that because the people that we sell to every day, yeah. they depend on that. Yeah. They depend on that market. Yeah. 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 We don't want to undercut them. <clears throat> well, how does it look so far? You've started your... You've started your season. You've started mm -hmm. looking at them. You've got it. You've got it flooded. Now we're going to go out and take pictures. Yeah, the fields are flooded. We had a good, I guess you could say, rainy season, but rain at the proper time. Yeah. Because you really need that ground to stay soft. Mm -hmm. uh, because for those crawfish to be able to that survive in the yeah. ground to come out. Yeah. And uh, so. Looks like we're going to have a pretty good season because of that, but we've also put some test traps out. Okay. And uh, start we have some crawfish, so. Start checking sizes and yeah. stuff. So now one of the things that I talk about with a lot of farmers is, is it just them or do they have other people who help them with the farm? What does your farm labor situation look like? Okay, well, we have a small farm, so yeah. it's a family farm. Uh, 
my wife and I pretty much do a lot of the work during mm -hmm. the uh, preparation for crawfish season yeah. uh, and so forth, and even with the rice planting and harvesting when we do rice. Um, but we really depend on uh, foreign labor for the harvest. Right. And we get um, H-2A workers out of Mexico. Uh, we have tried domestic labor before. It's hard to find just the nature of this business. It's labor intense. Right. It's just hard to find people who will actually do the work. And is that mostly seasonal kind of labor that you get in? Do you have some of those people that come back year after year that work with you and that maybe work with other farmers on a seasonal basis? I have The ones that I have have been with me for eight, maybe nine years. Uh, we usually get four or five workers a year. Yeah. And the harvesting, the way that we do it, involves a lot of walking. They yeah. actually push boats. Now, sometimes we'll use a mechanical boat, too, yeah. but uh, they'll actually push boats, and not everybody wants to do that. And I bet that makes a difference. If you're doing it manually, it might be a little bit easier on some of the things than mechanical damage could be. Well, as far as a mechanical part, they're still harvested even in a mechanical okay. boat by hand, so it really doesn't affect it that much. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it does affect the condition of your fields yeah. because the, the boats have wheels or tracks in the back that cause ruts. Right. And uh, so we like to plant rice behind the crawfish when we can. So you want your fields to stay in good shape. But also another factor uh, with the walking is they're not running over traps. Right. And we normally run about 15 traps to the acre. Right. That's something that we probably didn't talk about earlier. No, but, we uh, didn't talk about them at yeah. all. But you actually yeah. put traps out for your harvest? And That's right. They're, yeah, that's just a pyramid-type trap. We can take a picture of one okay. of them, and, you know, you can see that. And uh, you just got to pray the right crawfish come in there, you throw the little ones back? Well, actually, they grade out. Okay. The uh, Now, not all of them. But I like this. Yeah, yeah, they'll grade out. And, yeah. and what doesn't, we have graders yeah. that when we harvest them, you know, it'll grade out your what we call a peeler which goes right. for uh, uh, the tail meat, yeah. so to speak, and then, of course, your live market of the larger crawfish. I'm glad we talked about that because I hadn't even thought about how you grade those things. But yeah. I notice when I buy them, they typically are all about the same size. Now, right. at the first of the season, they may be smaller than they are later in the season. That's correct. Um, just because the crawfish have had additional time to grow and everything. That's but, right. Uh, that grading process and getting the right meat, put into the right part of the market makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. just like it does in eggs and everything else yeah with crawfish people think the bigger the better you know well it just means it's you, fewer things you have to peel open is all I, yeah I'm, it, I'm, I just it's true <laughs> that's true yeah <laughs> all right thanks so much that gets us to the end of the podcast Hope you have a chance to go on the website, groundedbythefarm.com. I think you're going to enjoy seeing some of the ponds and how the boats actually navigated a little bit. But quite frankly, I was most blown away by the photos of crawfish with their eggs or babies. I know, it's crazy. Also, just getting a feel for stellies now that you've heard a little bit of the atmosphere. I think you'll enjoy that too. So thanks so much. I'm Janice Person. So glad you joined us here on Grounded by the Farm.